and go over your own dreams and kind of work them out. And I hear the longer version of this presentation. I'm going to try to um, do a little bit of both, everything at once. Um, have an experience, you know, it's hard, you know, you have this kind of, talking about dream work, it's really a very exciting topic and fun to work with, but we don't want to make it too, too academic, although the IPA is a very academic uh, organization, so we want to try to keep it a little bit more experiential, a little academic. And I'll go over some clinical work and the constructs of dreams and the psychohistorical uh, background of dreams, the analysis of dreams. So I'm uh, going to cover some ground. Hopefully we'll cover some ground we'll, and, and enjoy the experience too. So let's take a look here. Slide out. The dance between yeah. a latent and a manifest while, in, while interpreting dreams, a practitioner's guide. Okay. I'm going to work this out here. All this technology. Okay, today's paper will be aimed at what seems to be a rather trite subject in today's world. Um, the phenomenological dance between the manifest, uh, that is the remembered dream, It pops off this computer, so the manifest or remembered dream and the latent dream. Um, the thoughts and feelings inspired by the associations uh, to the dream, to the manifest dream, which Freud believed formed the architecture of the remembered dream. There was a time in this discussion that it wasn't so quaint, actually, that we're talking about the manifest and latent dream. Let's see. <coughs> There we are. Okay, we're going. We're doing it. Okay, good. Um, this discussion actually broke down psychoanalysis. There was a big divide in psychoanalysis because when Freud talked about the latent dream, meaning that he was talking about the latent sexual wish, libido, that's what he was originally, the interpretation of dreams was all about. It was about the, the hiding, this forbidden sexual instinctive energies behind the symbolic manifest dream, which he felt was more like a neurotic sim uh, symptom, that it was a disguise. So anybody who looked at the manifest, remembered dream, and tried to interpret it symbolically, he felt was anti-psychoanalytic. And he was not really part of the psychoanalytic movement. And that comes because our friend Carl Jung worked from the manifest Alfred Adler worked from the ma manifest. Nearly every psychoanalyst worked from the manifest. And I'll tell you a secret, Freud worked from the manifest. He just, he also though was profoundly interested in creating a theoretical position that tied a dream analysis to biology, to instincts. And so he, he, he had a particular version to people, anytime using like a symbolic approach, even though he had used it throughout his work, you see interpretation of dreams, you go beyond, he wrote a, a book on folklore and um, dreaming for Oppenheim, another fellow in Oppenheim, they worked together and they had this book on folklore and dreams and folklore, and they used all interpretive, symbolic interpretive stuff. Of course, Freud interpreted nearly every aspect of the dreams that he saw in folklore uh, as repressed sexual wishes, every one. So, um, he was kind of single-minded in that position. So on the practical side, um, if you're hesitant to use dreams, if, if you're a practitioner and you don't really use dreams that much, hopefully this presentation will help you feel more comfortable with that. If you never use dreams, maybe just encourage you to use it. If you're not a practitioner or just interested, you know, the good thing is that Freud, his initial work was built on his own dreams, his self-analysis. So analyzing dreams and studying your own dreams, it is a royal road to self-understanding. I don't know if it's a royal road to sexually forbidden wishes. Yeah. Perhaps it is as a piece of it, 
But it certainly it opens a door for us to look at ourselves in a kind of variety of ways, in novel ways. I have this theory, actually, that I believe the function of dreaming is to create novelty. That the dream experience is uniquely organized. Everyone in this room, in every room in this building, in every building in Manhattan, and so on, everyone has a dream every night. Now, whether you remember that dream is due for many reasons why you wouldn't remember a dream, but every night you have a dream, or multiple dreams, or countless dreams. All those dreams, by the way, are unique, like a fingerprint. No one has dreamed the same dream. Well, yeah, I have a falling dream. This looks like a falling dream. And I have this, uh, an examination dream where I walk into a room and the room is, you know, they're not taking the test and I'm not there. Everyone has a similar dream. That, However, it's not exactly similar. It's populated by different people, different affect, different elements to it. So every dream is uniquely organized. And you think about that. In the history of humanity, no one's dreamed your dream. And every night, you're completely your original creation. So when we work therapeutically with someone, what you're saying to that person when you ask them about their dream, you're asking them to show you their personal, intimate, unique self. And if you value a dream as a psychotherapist, what you're doing is valuing the individual unique experience that person is having and sharing with you. So the dream becomes this incredible bridging function to actually have that conversation, which we'll go into a little more detail. Here we go. We're going to go back in time. Right? You know, psychoanalysis, psychotherapy, Counseling today is no difference than a hundred years ago with Freud. It's about a conversation. Freud starts his large book when he went to Clark University and um, he lectured and he spoke for hours on end, in German by the way, without a translator. I don't know, I guess people were supposed to understand German back in 1912. He started the, his presentation in, in, in introductory lectures on psychoanalysis that he said psychoanalysis is merely a conversation. And even in today's world, or 100 years ago, <coughs> just having a conversation. So what's so fascinating, and what I always find so striking, is that, that of all the technological changes, uh, uh, changes to our society and communications, and Steve and I were talking about Skyping, you know, uh, you know, it's all the stuff that's going on. It's still a conversation. We're still looking to create that conversation. It's organic as, as Freud's original work. So, <coughs> oh yeah, the Irma dream. This is where it begins. This is ground zero for psychoanalysis. I, I wrote a paper a few years ago, and it was called, um, uh, Freud's Irma Dream and the Origins of Psychoanalysis in a Bloody Nose. It's the name of the paper. And the um, paper really goes into the backstory of the Irma Dream. The Irma Dream is the second chapter of Interpretation of Dreams. Interpretation of Dreams starts off with kind of a review of dream therapy, dream analysis, and Freud dismisses the whole bunch of it, all the symbolic stuff and prophecy from the Bible and so on. His book starts chapter two, which is spectacular. He gives us his dream, the dream of Irma's injection. And it's, just, it's kind of it fills about three quarters of the page. So it's Irma's injection. He goes through this whole thing. And in the summer of 1895, I'm going to paraphrase it from my paper. The summer of 1895, he's a mess. That spring, he has a case, a woman named Emma Eckstein. And he, uh, he's doing a, she just has hysteria, everyone has hysteria, so she's had pains, he's paralyzed, all this stuff going on. And he's working with her, and he tells his friend, his new friend, really kind of new BFF he has, mm -hmm. named Wilhelm Fleece. So he's kind of fed up with Brewer, because Brewer, who they, right, they're publishing this book now, hasn't come out yet, studies on hysteria. He and Brewer are breaking up. But Brewer says, I can't do the sexual stuff you're talking about for lots of reasons, a lot of back reasons, that why Brewer stays away from all the sexual material from N.O., which is the case they worked on. So Freud, 
you know, has a particular, so I, I need someone to work off of. Says Wilhelm Flee shows up, who is an ear, nose, and throat specialist in Berlin. And they become super best friends. They correspond most lovingly, brotherly, friendly correspondence back and forth. I'm with you, Sigmund. I'm with you, Wilhelm. And they're together, and they're so intensely interested in this thing. He's sharing all his sexual theories, and, and um, Wilhelm Flee is saying, yes, keep going, that's the spot. And by the way, I think that people are mostly bisexual, and Freud says, yes, you're right, they're bisexual. And by the way, I think that the turbinite no, part of the nose, right, mm. if, if you operate on that, it'll cure hysteria. Because there's a linkage between the female genitalia and the turbinite nose, the turbinite bone in the nose. He says they look alike. And if you cut it out, you're going to cure hysteria. Troy says, good idea. <laughs> In fact, operate on me, because I have hysteria, hysterical symptoms. I have neurosis. Uh, earlier that year, he did. He operated on Freud. And it was, um, I can't say it was a successful operation. Freud continued to have all types of issues. But it didn't deter Freud from Wilhelm Fleece. I'm playing around with this. So this is the background now. This is the spring of 1895, a psychohistorical conference here, so I have to keep it real historical. 1895, um, he's on the verge of this. He has the MX down. He says, you know what? Operate on her nose, and I'll help you with that operation. So in February of that year, 1895, they operate on her nose. Successful operation, MX down, kind of fantastic. You got it. Let's, let's go to lunch. It's a simple operation. We're out of here. We're done. Next day, Eckstein has a fever. A fever. She's sick. He turns to Wilhelm Flee, so what's going on? He says, I don't know, it's just a reaction to no big deal. A week later, her fever continues to rise. Mm -hmm. She's sicker and sicker and sicker. And continues to be very sick. It goes on for the next month, and she's deathly ill now. Freud is doomed. He says, I can't believe it. I, I don't know what's happening here. And he's telling the Wilhelm Fleece, who he stays very much lovingly involved with. I can't believe this is going on. This is terrible. What can possibly go on? And so they call in a month later now. She's sickly as can be. In pain. It just seems to be her face is pale. He's writing letters to Fleece. Fleece goes back to Berlin. He's writing letters to her, him. And he's telling her, this is going bad. She's going to die. There's no question. She's, she's dying. And I'm, my career will be ruined. This is it for me. And he calls in a specialist, um, a Dr. Rosans, an ear, nose, and throat guy in Vienna, who takes a look at, at um, uh, Emma and says, I think we've got to go back in, mm -hmm. <laughs> he says. He says, OK, let's go back in. So he goes back in. And then going back in, he says, I don't know what's going on here. Why is she so sickly? He says, wait a second. I noticed something inside your nose. And he says, let me just pull this out. He, pull, he sees something, and it's a little bit of gauze. Mm -hmm. He pulls out, I believe it's a three meter mm -hmm. string of gauze left in her nose during that operation. Literally, her nose explodes. You remember the movie Alien? That scene in Alien where the alien pops out of the chest? That's what happened to her face. Mm. Freud nearly passes out. His legs shake. He begins to fall apart. Rosanne is there, who's a steady doctor, takes care of the business of packing that nose again and getting it organized so she doesn't bleed to death. Her blood pressure is down to his the negative at this point. And Freud says, you're going to die. That's it. So I am done. And somehow, miraculously, Emma survives. But she stays sick for the next two months. And she almost dies again over the next two months. And, they have, and Freud has a specialist, and particularly Rosanis, who comes in and works on her nose, writing letters to Felice the whole time, saying that, OK, so why am we saying all this? Why am I bringing this all this up? So anyhow, he gets to Emma Eckstein, Eckstein, and she survives. And by the way, Emma Eckstein becomes the first psychoanalyst. Mm. She's 
she, uh, before 1899, she's the first practicing psychoanalyst. She stayed loyal to Freud. And uh, when she, after the operations, and she survives, and so, and Freud continued to analyze her bleeding in her nose as a sexual uh, hysteria event. And so at the end of it, in one of the comments he writes to the police, he says, I walked into the room and she was there and she looks at me and smiles and says, so this is the strong sex? And that was the uh, next on the episode. But Freud's letters to Fleece was that my life is over. I'm gloom. This is the gloomiest part. I cannot believe that this has happened. She survives. Psychoanalysis survives, by the way. That's my theory in my paper. You know, somehow at that moment, she did not turn on him. She did not sue him. She didn't do anything. She just stayed true to him. And that gave them the confidence to move forward. Flash forward a month later, in June, he has another patient, close, again, they're kind of in a circle of people, Anna Hammerschlag, friend of the family, he's treating her for hysteria. She has kind of an erotic thing going on for Freud. And so um, they have this thing back and forth, and it's the summer vacation, so they're both um, uh, going to vacation spot in Bellevue in, in Vienna, which is a little country spot outside of Vienna. You can see Vienna. That, that was the hotel where they hang on the veranda. And, 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 and so Freud, let me show you a picture. Um, here's Wilhelm Fleece, by the way. There he is. And so, um, so these two now, like, they're still in correspondence. Everything's going along. He's working on Anna like And Anna like goes to uh, Bellevue, and their families commingle. And so Martha's having a birthday party July 29th. She's pregnant with her sixth child, who happens to be Anna Freud. Pregnant with Anna, giving a lot of birth to things. Um, she's pregnant, not feeling well. They're having this birthday party. Anna Hammerschlag is going to be at that birthday party. He has a dream. Um, no, but uh, what happens, he, uh, the night before the dream, he's, he hears in the grapevine that the Hammerschlag family, who he's treating, Anna Hammerschlag, by the way, he names Anna Freud after Anna Hammerschlag, by the way. He's having this um, hearing discontent in the Hammerschlag family, who's very close to, that they don't think the talking therapy is really helping Anna. And he's hearing it also from his other doctor, Oscar Rye, that, you know, I don't think this talking therapy is so helpful to Anna. Anna still has pain. She says this and that. So he's hearing these complaints. And so he writes this big case description, which he sends to Brewer, trying to justify his treatment of Anna Hammerschlag. That next day, he wakes up and has chapter two of interpretation of dreams. He has the dream of Fermi's injection, the dream specimen of psychoanalysis. It is the DNA of psychoanalysis. That dream is the most interpreted, most analyzed dream in the history of dreams. When Freud put that in the second chapter, he set forward the notion of free association. So um, we can have, we, do you want to hear the dream? Would you like to hear the, what it sounds like the dream? You can kind of free associate to it, it's cool. Um, there's, there's, about ten, there's about 10 more minutes to the presentation part. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So uh, it's going to be hard to fit that in there. Okay. So okay. I'll give you a brief synopsis. He has a patient, a female patient. He tries to diagnose her. He does all types of maneuvering, opening up her mouth and this and that. And he's trying to justify his treatment to the surrounding people around him who are, who are doubting his technique. He wakes up from that dream and he has this notion in his mind that the dream is really to understand this dream, we have to see what the intent of the dream is. And in that he unwraps this notion that if you associate to the dream elements, you will find the truth of the dream. It's called the latent content. That starts psychoanalysis. July 24th, 1895, Freud wakes up and realizes the secret of dreams is, is given to Freud on July 24th, 1895. I don't want to know that because there's a sign outside of Bellevue that says, on July 24th, 1895, the secret of dreams is revealed to Dr. Sidman Freud. 
And so in that moment, he sees the latent content and begins to realize that his wish for revenge against the people who doubted him is that dream. If you ever want to see the dream, you go into Interpretation of Dreams, Chapter 2. The beautiful part about it, you see this, when you talk about manifest and latent, let's see if I can have a whole lot of picture of it. Here's the dream, by the way, if I put it up here, manifest and latent. This is the manifest, this is a representation of what Freud was talking about, in the manifest latent. The manifest would be the top of the iceberg, the, the latent is below. This is what Freud was thinking. All this energy leads to that. So that, uh, that manifests in latent, this discussion, all his ideas, he has this notion that he begins to associate to that dream and begins to see this all unconscious motives. He begins his self-analysis in a sense at that time where he begins to look at um, following the train of associations. Part of the thing I wanted to do today, but we have a short on time, is I take like a word, take a, any word, let me see, like, um, Uh, I think, uh, we'll take a word like, um, I'm just going to go through this over. Take a word um, like night. The word night. N-I-G-H-T. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? First thing, don't think. Just Darkness. say the first thing. Darkness. First thing that comes to mind. Try it. Darkness, yeah. Darkness. 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 I thought darkness. We all thought darkness. Oh, sweet. You know, it's like, sweet. Next thing that comes to mind, darkness. Next thing that comes to mind. Nine, near. It's semantic. Armor. First thing that comes to mind with armor. First thing. Don't go. Just oh, don't go. Oh, night uh, with a K. Oh, well, you said night with oh night was with a K. See, see the associations out? You uh, see? Uh, oh. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. No night with a K. First association. Sleep. Jousting. Jousting. <laughs> armor and weapons. Swords. <laughs> You notice we shifted from night, sleep, to war. How did that happen? Yeah. You know, collectively, we have a collective unconscious here now, in the room. So we were shifting from, from defense, nights, jousting, there's war going on. But yet we have, we start off with night. It's a neutral word. Day. So what happens, exactly, what happens is that, um, for I noticed that there's all types of intention behind it, it manifests a dream symbol. So in so doing, he was able to say, in his view, because he wanted to connect to Darwin, and Darwin's idea was that we're animals, so therefore there's an instinctual element that's bedrock. Freud was destined, wanted to find the bedrock. The signifier of the bedrock was the Oedipus complex. Why? Why the Oedipus complex? Because of all things human, people don't sleep with each other in the same family. He says, that's an odd thing, he says to himself. Because we're humans, why would we distinguish that? Why would we be programmed not to do that? Because it's instinctive not to do that. It's not good for the preservation of the species. He began to unpack the instinctual element, which he believed was at the bottom of all dreams. Since dreams are from mammals, mammals are instinctive, he made the linkage in saying, look, all this is a representation of the sexual urge, forbidden sexual urge. All his hysteria patients had forbidden sexual urges or had been sexually molested at this time he was writing. And they were, and they were hiding that. And so anything had to do with sexuality. Brew, of course, was nothing, no part of this. Well, I'm pleased on the other hand said, yes, absolutely. And not only that, like I said earlier, bisexuality. It's all about bisexuality, which Floyd kind of stole a little bit from Fleece. Actually, I thought he stole it completely. Right, yeah, <laughs> probably. I, I'm going to give everyone the benefit of that. I wasn't at that, at, when they're drinking beer at, in, in Vienna and hanging out at the cafes and saying, no, it was my idea, no, it was your idea. There's a, there's a conversation that they had. Fleece would do, generally, but Fleece in history is a crackpot. See, so history didn't treat Fleece, Fleece very well. Because Freud is the icon. At least was the, the seemed the fool. 
But if you go back in time, Fleece was a very respected EMT guy. So it's an interesting thing that Fleece's life kind of unraveled and didn't really kind of work out for him. And he couldn't really get that published in bisexuality. He couldn't make a point about it. If it was his idea, he couldn't sell it. Freud sold it. Uh, I got handed to that. He took the idea and he integrated it in. So I'll give Freud a lot of points on that because even if he had the notion of it, maybe two minutes. The key element of my presentation, which I'm going to reduce into two minutes, <laughs> even though I have four hours worth of material, um, I'm going to zip through this, is that when dream is presented, it's a multifunction event. And we always forget that. If you ask a patient or a person to dream, it's multiple layers that are happening at once. So what's happening is a person, you're asking a person to dream two dreams, probably more two of you. You ask a person to tell you a dream. The act of telling you a dream requires the act of remembering. So that's one collection of resistances and structures are in place, the act to remember. To say a dream is the act of, act of articulating an internal creation. So you're, you're, what you're doing is saying something and organizing your mind. Freud called it secondary revision, but you organize your mind to actually say something to someone. Thirdly, the other person to listen to it and effectively respond to that dream experience. So the act of remem remembering, dreaming, remembering, talking, conversing about the dream, reinterpreting the dream, and um, coming to a conclusion about that dream is a multi, you see the multiple levels of ha what's happening in that experience that's uniquely configured in that moment for you and that person you're talking to. So I cannot <coughs> emphasize the intense value, valuation of the experience. Even if you're a therapist, I have, I have patients always say to me, what does it mean? What does it mean? It means that you're telling me the dream. That's what it means. <laughs> That's cool. That's where it's at. If you tell me this dream, you know, we're in this moment of having a conversation. Even if you know anything about dreams, and you want to go deeper into a dream, just ask, ask the person you're talking to, patient or otherwise, what's the feeling in the dream? Tell me your feeling in the dream. When you think of the bridge in the dream, what comes to mind? I don't know, a uh, bridge. I say, well, what bridge? Well, I don't know, uh, the George Washington Bridge. I said, well, what's George Washington coming to mind? What do you think of George Washington? What do you think of that? Uh, I don't know, he's a father of our country. Talk about fathers. <laughs> Boom. We are now off to the races. And that's the manifest latent. So we look at the manifest, right? That top part of the dream. It always cool slides. These are the different techniques that the mind uses in order to um, uh, structure a dream. I just want to make a point that in Freud's, um, okay, uh, Freud's interpretation of dreams, the Irma dream is about a a three quarters of one page or half a page. His analysis is 13 pages. So you can see that manifest, you remember that the iceberg, right? It's like, that's what we want to get to in the conversation with our patients and as practitioners, the excitement, the enthusiasm of dream work. I've had patients who have I would say 70, 85% of their analysis with me over years is primarily dreams. Not because I've been particularly wanting them to say this to me, they're excited to want to get into this and it unpacks into a lot of areas. Whether it's memory, fantasy, uh, a woman I was working with and she had this dream that is kind of suggestively sexual. And this is a woman who doesn't particularly talk about sex with me and I've worked with her for a long time. And I say, not for nothing, but the dream in New Jersey by the way, it's a little my New Jersey's coming out, not for nothing. Um, the dream uh, references sexuality like, in every part of it. Uh, so I think we need to talk about that. She says, you know, it's funny, I wanted to mention that. And I'm thinking, no, we're talking about vibrators, we're talking about, uh, we're talking about all types of things. And we're getting into a subject, and it really opens the door to discussing her body image. It's fantastic, it's just fantastic. But one more little point, I had a fellow I was working with, I did work with recently, um, I was 80 years old, uh, he's a psychologist, and a um, uh, behaviorist, you know, type of thing, you know, done the unconscious type of stuff. So I keep on hawking him about the unconscious, he gets mad at me, he's hiding it all the time. So it's like, um, he says to me, he gets really mad at me, 
really super and aggression is coming out at me. And he's saying, I can't tell you what you talk to me. You're, you're putting me down. You don't understand what I'm doing. He's giving me such a hard time. He really blasts me. I'm not coming back to therapy anymore. Fuck you. I'm not coming back to therapy. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, well, we text a little bit. We email. You know, it's a modern world. We email. So he comes back in and he says, he expressed all this aggression. And by the way, he sees himself as a person who is the kindest, nicest, gentlest person in the world. That he's never, in all these years, ever really lost his temper. He's always been a kind, nice fellow. I mean, he can't believe what I have done to him created this, this thing in him, a demon that has showed up. Then he tells me, I had this dream throughout my life, a repetitive dream I have all the day, that someone pulls my pants down and sees my genitals and then humiliates me. And I have this repetitive dream over and over. And he says, you know, I nearly have it every week of my life. And I said, wow. He says, you know, it's funny, last week after I said this to you, I don't have a dream. <laughs> no, I'm dreaming. He was like, shot. I said, okay. Okay, thanks for the gift, I said. Mm. Thank you for understanding your conscious. Thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, we've never seen each other now. We're back in business. Yeah, it's cool. All right, that's okay, it. Thank you. All right, thanks.